At one time, every village, every group, every community had a spiritual leader, right? And nobody said, you're doing it wrong. Um, every man was still the king in his own home. Every man tossed the runes in his own home with his, with his significant other. But there was always a village elder that held a special spiritual position. There was always a communal building where the feasts and the holy days were celebrated and the sacrifices were made. There was always some kind of guidance for people who wanted help. One of the things that I see, I saw the other day on TikTok, it was um, five or six people sharing, sharing, or how do they share the video? You do edit. Yeah, they were all do editing this. Uh, this um, I don't know who this joker was, but he was he was on a rant about Nazis using symbols. And my very first thought was, well, I'm not in favor of the of that far right kind of ideology. I see the values of certain aspects of it, but I'm not a, a proponent of it. I also think that the idea that I hate because I think you hate is probably one of the most asinine things there is in existence. So how do we how do we navigate this situation as we mature into something that really and truly helps people through the difficult times of life? And there are some very difficult times in life. No matter, we cannot sit here and make offering and sacrifice and pray and hope that we have an easy life. It just ain't how it works. There's heartache, there's pain, there's loss. We can't use the ideas at either end of the spectrum to help us navigate those difficult situations in life. We cannot provide comfort, support, encouragement, the kind of things we need to help people, even with the tough times of a hard day. So what do we need to do? So I began to put my keen and penetrating intellect to it, and I probably came up with the wrong conclusion, but I'm going to try and see how it goes. So I started writing a book. Um, one of the things that struck me is that under every spirituality, and I don't care time, history, or place, there's an aspect of a sacred tree. And so much happens beneath that sacred tree. The first thought most of us would think of were the norms beneath it, still weaving the weak lives of men. Every thought, choice we make, forces that weave into a different direction, a different strength or weakness. Everything moves it uh, up or down uh, our, our, our uh, axis, our central axis. Buddha achieved nirvana under the Bodhi tree. So many things happen under the sacred tree to the Gnostic. Um, Jesus on the cross was the tree of life. Um, and in fact, for the first 600 years, the church would not use the cross as the symbol of the church because every pagan religion that they were that they were working against had a, had an image of a deity that was sacrificed and hung on a tree. All of them: Dionysus, Bacchus, or Hercules, uh, Odin. All of these ancient pagan spiritualities that had some kind of structure to them had symbols of a god on a cross, a tree of some kind. I found that in a book called um, Aryan Sun Myths, written in 1889 on the origin of religions. In fact, you know what? I'm going to read that before I get into this. So some of you may have seen my video on the lore is not too heavily Christianized. Um, some of it came from this book. And there's an interesting, an interesting tale here. Maybe I won't find it. I won't go with it. You probably have to watch the other video. Yep, I can't find it. I failed. 
so anyway, having said all that, if you watch the other video, it'll go into the Lord's not too heavily Christianized, and it'll tell you where it comes from, why it comes from, what his origination is, and so many other things, all of these ideas that literally go across time, geography, and history. How do we start with it? How do we start to approach this idea and get this thing under control that it might help us? Well, we start with critical thinking. It's many things, but so are the foundational rudiments of faith. Now, all of them seem to have the qualifying rule of thumb that we get out of our current models of thinking, right? And that's a real challenge in an air arena where so many people say, well, I can make this up as I want to. I don't need to follow. There's no right way. There's no wrong way. Well, there are certain universal constants, and you can find them throughout spiritualities and mythologies, okay? Now, critical thinking has been defined as thinking about thinking, all right? Now, there are a plethora of conditions that have to be considered as we approach this act, okay? Just as there are with setting the stage to build a faith in your life, which works, okay? <clears throat> To define critical thinking and the rudiments of faith is one thing, right? To be a critical thinker or be counted amongst the faithful is quite another. And we have a knee-jerk reaction against kind of both of those. Why do I want to, I've always railed kind of against the, against the academic and the intellectual because I think there's failure there, there's shortcomings there. I have railed against the blindly faithful because there's shortcomings there as well, aren't there? So why would I be bringing this back into the idea, into the fold of thought process that we need to consider? Well, much of the criteria that qualifies our understanding of the definition of both of these concepts resides around what may be boiled down to the elimination of egocentric thought processes. I know that always rouses a few feathers too. I don't have an ego. I'm say, Brian Milton, your ego is bigger than everybody's. It could be. Indeed, the very first principle of leadership is to know yourself, seek self-improvement, right? And I wrote that in the soldier's edit. I'm probably going to go over it again in this book, these 11 principles of leadership. But the first one, the very first one, before you can do anything for anybody else, is to know yourself and seek self-improvement. So in my own life, I continue to stay physically fit. I'm going to college to learn how to write a book worth reading, right? So I'm educating myself. I'm staying fit. I'm working the kind of job at a, at a high-level in a facility that is known around the world, right? So I'm, I'm achieving success in more than one arena of my life. I'm continuing to try to know myself, seek self-improvement. I don't always succeed. And people have watched me because I have done it in public like John fucking Wayne, fall on my face and fail. Good. It didn't kill me. Everybody should understand that. We get back up and we try again, right? That's how we learn who we are. <clears throat> the first priority in the undertaking of this task to be a critical thinker is the elimination of preconceived notions. It's a very tough thing to do. What will I look like if I let go of this or that idea? Who will I become? What will other people think? Well, this includes the preconceived notions of who we believe ourselves to be. Biases we want to be true, prejudices we assume, so on and so forth. All of these thoughts exist so we might feel better about ourselves in perhaps some of the shallowest ways possible. And that's a very bitter pill for me to swallow. <clears throat> but they are also roadblocks to any meaningful element of faith. They are also what makes us who we are. We learn them in school, we learn them in church, we see them in the news, social media. None of it requires us to do a thing to improve the quality of our thoughts except to reinforce the righteous indignation necessary to join the crowd and be accepted or to stand alone. Now, much of the time, it is the ego masquerading as ourselves. As Dr. Obadiah S. Harris, PhD, suggests, your greatest enemy is your own inner perception, your own ignorance, your own ego. Now, let's consider that ego is to believe ourselves the center of all that has happened. On a personal level, you need that. You need to understand that you are the only one who is going to look out for your well-being and your vested interests. 
No one else is going to build your future for you. That's you. You have to do that. We have to have a real filter to say, okay, is this good for me? Is this bad for me? Is this going to move me forward? Or am I simply following somebody else's way? Okay. It's how we determine our autonomy. Now, once you go beyond that, embracing the idea that your best interests will suit everyone else around you, we're kind of off target, aren't we? I may not know, I can identify with, I can, I can. I can feel some of the things you feel. I, I haven't created any new emotions, so I can share some of that with you. I have some experience, but that doesn't necessarily mean I'm walking in your shoes. Sometimes we get lost in that. I know I've done it. <clears throat> the evidence of such an effort on a global scale is more than present, more than present in hundreds of millions of social media profiles. A place where we might magnify the image of who we are. without ever engaging in the hard work of self-examination necessary to achieve such a status. So it would stand to reason then that the single greatest factor impacting our ability to be a critical thinker or to implement the tools of faith in our life is an egocentric thought process. We have to learn how to get out of our own way. As Lau and Chan implied, we must reflect on the justification of one's own beliefs and values. Such a proposition is quite difficult to do when we start from a preconceived notion that we are something which we are not. Not everybody is wrong though, and everybody has the right to be wrong. There's a lot of freedom in that statement if you think about it. Now there are several arenas within the realm of Austrian, Norse paganism and heathenry, or whatever someone wishes to call their faith, which really do need the veil of faith lifted just a hair. So we might examine what it is we're attempting to accomplish here. When we see ridiculous comments such as the law is too heavy to Christianized, or their operating belief that an opposing side is attempting to co-op a belief system, all I see our lesser men attempt to do is create the false dichotomy of us against them. It is an all too easy point to point out the failures of such men. What I'm going to do here with this work is outline a manner of thinking fully rooted in the core concepts of the principles of leadership and the ideas of critical thought wrapped up in these ideas of our faith. Now, this will give you tools you can use, not some high-minded ideas about racial success or liberal nonsense, an outline for a thoughtful and passionate spirituality based in reality. Once a person is in possession of such powerful concepts, the various attributes which continue to stymie and confuse the spiritual development of this ancient faith that is being reborn into a new world will fall away. Maybe it will give the courage to begin a process of examining ourselves in a truly courageous manner, a manner that allows growth in ways much of our spirituality has not heretofore witnessed. See, at first, it's hard to accept that there is that such a concept has any worth, right? that we might have a higher capacity for discerning truth if we accept on faith that we can lay small-minded notions to the side. It will require something more for many of us to open our eyes. Critical thought and a very study of leadership principles round out a clear-headed approach to finding these tools where they happen to be all along within ourselves. As clarity has been the gift of so many others using these concepts, a chance they will fall upon you. Sometimes there will be a rapid onset of awakening. Other times it will happen in its own sweet time. And as I write the book, I was thinking about what does it look like if we fully embrace this faith? Excuse me. Perhaps it's not all rainbows and sunshine and, and you know, some kind of magnificent spiritual experience. For me, it's sitting in my living room looking around thinking, you know what? This is a pretty good gig today. I have not always felt that way about my life. Mythologies around the world and throughout time tell us that it has happened many times in our history. Some of the more famous ones happened beneath the sacred tree. First, let us define a few things. 
We start with intellectual autonomy. In a Rutilian divine is the ability to think for oneself. The idea is that we might be capable of discerning a more accurate depiction of a given issue when challenged by the status quo or the mindset of our peers. Most adherents to any pagan spirituality seem to pride themselves upon the knowledge that they have been through the various deceptions and failings of Abrahamic religions. Yet for any of these spiritualities and ancient belief systems to once again thrive, I would submit to you that we're going to need a little bit more than that. Activated knowledge is that thought process that allows us to absorb pertinent information into our thinking. And this information we believe to be true that fosters within us once we can comprehend what it means and it's relevant and accurate direction to obtain more knowledge. Activated knowledge is at the heart of becoming a critical thinker. Yes. It is not something that is overlooked by our ancestors. Throughout time in the mythologies of the world, the necessity to question and answer well has been at the heart of the challenges of many a champion has faced. Think of a spirituality. Think of a scenario where the spiritual head has not had to engage in some kind of contest of wills and questioning and answer well. It's in all of them. <clears throat> Perhaps the most famous is the Riddle of the Sphinx, but there are many others. In the Havamal, it states in stanza 142, then I began to thrive in wisdom, yet I grew and well I was. Each word led me on to another word and each deed to another deed. This is the benefit of activated knowledge. Tales of our ancestors from around the globe recognize the importance of our ability to comprehend knowledge made available to us by the routine question and answer scenario concerning not only ourselves, but also the world around us both seen and unseen. Socrates and Plato brought such a thought process to a high point amongst the Greeks, and so it was until religion covered it with a veil we dare not look under. The question and answer well is the heart of activated knowledge. It is learning and an understanding of truth that leads us on to more and more learning, Richard Call, 2001. It is the creation of a broad new horizon within our thought processes that engenders an urge to explore, to learn for the sake of learning, to explore the broad horizon of spirituality. I have always been so fond of Such pursuits have always been the bulwark against the evils inherent in the nature of men. Activated knowledge, it seems, is that thought process that elevates man to a level where he might achieve intellectual autonomy. In doing so, he may also step up to discover new avenues of faith. Activated ignorance, on the other hand, is an almost dogmatic adherence to biases and conditioned thought and typically only ever manifests as the individual becoming a parrot of information that is neither truthful or perhaps even useful. There are many that populate these spiritual halls of our ancestors. Newcomers in their unthinking approach to a newfound faith select the information which allows them to indulge in ideas that seem to foster more anger than anything else dogmatic adherence to incorrect information empowers the ego, the overpowering desire to be right, the fear of losing something if the other person is right, an accurate understanding of the manner in which people come to a complete absorption of biases and prejudice is the true understanding of the world we live in. Such notions at face value should evaporate in the light of truth, but they do not. Atrocities that bog of the mind have littered the course of human history. Hundreds of millions have died because of belief in one true God of Christians and Muslims. Similarly, hundreds of millions have perished in the 20th century alone as men have sought to replace God or gods with governments touting centralized control. Nazis, communists of all stripes, regional warlords, drug kingpins, wars, Democrats. They have fostered against their own people and the world has had a catastrophic effect on the quality of life for perhaps billions of people. Staggering losses and immense personal pain have manifested that these self-same biases and prejudices that people have willingly accepted become vital parts of their identities. The ability to deny these wrongdoings against humankind is a type of activated ignorance. It is as manna from heaven for the ego of men who believe that they know something, which everyone else does not understand. So the cycle continues. Ignorance treated as truth 
is no trivial matter, Richard Paul. These straightforward definitions seem to provide a clear and concise framework that may define the rudimentary processes of critical, critical thinking. With such clearly delineated lines determining right and wrong, concerning the development and utilization of critical thinking skills, how is it we find such confusion amongst the various segments of our society and an inability to maintain meaningful, productive dialogues concerning the growth and well being of not only our spiritual selves, but also the society we wish to create? Intellectual autonomy concerning our faith is a cure for such elements of, this, of the human condition. Sadly, though, it is a rare thing. Intellectual autonomy is our ability to stand up and think for ourselves. It is the ability to stand squarely in the middle of an issue and say clearly and badly, no, this is wrong, or perhaps, yes, this is the best way. Yet when we have crowds of people in the street looting and burning over preconceived injustices, who among us is willing to stand in front of the mob and be judged? It is the one who owns activated knowledge and a solid foundation of faith. The one who has followed the hero's path as outlined in ancient history and who dares to stand alone. Why then is it such a difficult thing when all seems to be so cut and dry? Because there's a weapon of the clever, so vile, whose only purpose is to divide and conquer that few people stand a chance against it. Unless they have the vital critical thinking skills we have been discussing. What is that weapon? It is the half truth. It is foisted upon us night and day by politicians well-meaning co-workers and friends in our places of worship, in prison, on the streets, in the service, online, 24 hours a day by a product we call the news. Now, the challenge is not to stand in front of the crowd who may or may not listen, but to engage a large nebulous entity called social media, where such autonomy is more apt to be crucified before it is accepted. There are children committing suicide over such thing in today's world. A half-truth is a construct that may well be very false, but has enough truth in it to sound convincing. Enough plausibility for the unthinking or the ignorant to grab a hold and run with it, like it is the gospel truth. With the advent of social media and 24-hour news, we might hear such a half-truth a dozen times an hour. And every time we do, we will feel just a little bit better about ourselves because we think we are right. We deserve it. Flat Earth lunacy to global warming science, to the woke ideas of activated ignorance found amongst Antifa, BLM. All of them represent the most flawed aspects of science and painting this world has ever seen. And all of them are as false as it is possible to be. If there are individuals today whose identity is centered upon these and many other nonsensical crusades, as I have pointed out, my granny Wilton used favor of saying, Figures don't lie, but liars figure. Numbers can be arranged to support almost any argument. At a certain point, we will succumb to the idea and our activated ignorance decides to refute the part which is true or untrue, depending on what position we feel we most likely will boost our ego. And our acceptance amongst a digital crowd, we will likely never meet face to face. It is a great and cancerous growth that challenges the ability of mankind to move beyond determining greatness by the quantity of money one possesses or how right everyone believes them to be. Now we not only have a crowd of people we know to consider, but there's also a plethora of individuals we do not know more than willing to challenge our assertions and crucify us in the arena of public opinion. Under such circumstances, the half-truth becomes impossible to defend or support mind assumes a construct of, I am right and you are wrong. Very little progress is made against such a supposition. We all wonder why a bunch of people who don't know shit seem to lead the way. Well, now you know. Excuse me. Where does a regular man who is in the middle of attempting to embrace a new faith find any kind of answer? Well, let's start with a cursory examination of this. The Lord is too heavily Christianized. That's the preface to the new book, Beneath the Sacred Tree. I'm fairly proud of it. I think it's going to be really good, and I hope you enjoyed it. Does anyone have any questions or would like to talk about any of it? Because I haven't finished writing the third chapter, 
and I would really, I was really thinking that um, as we go through this, the second chapter is the 12 stages of a hero. We probably know we're not going to do it today, but think about it. The 12 stages of a hero, I'm adapting them to the 12 stages of faith. And perhaps we can all put in some ideas and craft something together because I don't know what everybody's journey looks like. I have an idea. But I think it might be very neat if we were to all contribute to something like that. 12 stages of a hero's journey are thus. And just be thinking about it. This is from Joseph Campbell, who created the monomyth because everybody's tale is the same. It's boiled down to some simple things. The ordinary world, this is the ordinary world of the hero, which suffers from a symbolic deficiency. The hero is lacking something, or something is taken from him. Second, second phase, the call to adventure. The hero is given a challenge, problem, or adventure. Often it appears as a blunder or chance. The stage establishes the goal of the hero. And there is the refusal of the call. The often reluctant hero has to be set along the correct path. He must weigh the consequences and be excited by a stronger motivation to proceed further. Meeting with mentor, the hero encounters a wise figure who prepares him for the journey. The figure or item gives advice, guides, or an item that cannot go with the hero, crossing the threshold. The hero is committed to his task and enters the special world. Often he is met by a threshold guardian. Think all the dickheads on Facebook. Test allies and enemies. In the special world, the hero learns the new rules by meeting people and obtaining new information. And there's often a local watering hole component, once again, or social media gathering place or get togethers. This is where the true characteristics of the hero are revealed. Approach to the innermost cave. Now, our hero and often his allies have come to the edge of the dangerous place where the object of the quest is hidden. The stage is often in the land of the dead. I have some thoughts on that. The supreme ordeal, the hero faces danger, often a life or death moment that is either physical or psychological. Symbolic death of our egos. Odin seems to epitomize that quite well, sacrificing himself to himself on the tree so he can hear the songs of his ancestor, gather up the runes, the cumulative knowledge of his ancestors in crystal form, and assuming the throne and becoming the partner he, that freaking deserves and needs. Reward or seizing the sword. After surviving, our hero takes possession of the object, typically a treasure, weapon, knowledge, token, or reconciliation. The road back. The hero must now deal with the consequences of their actions. They may be pursued by remaining force. Think being outed by Antifa or some shit like that. They now face the decision to return to the ordinary world. Resurrection or final test is required for the purification and rebirth of the hero. Alternatively, it may be a miraculous transformation. What does that look like for us when we follow this path? For me, it was simply looking around and realizing I have a good life today. I need to slow down a little bit to figure that out. Return with the elixir. The triumphant hero returns to the ordinary world bearing the elixir. Common elixirs are treasure, love, freedom, wisdom, or knowledge. A defeated hero is doomed to repeat the lesson. Campbell, 2003. So, yeah, I'm modifying that. Maybe next week we'll go over that. And we will discuss each step as regards to our spiritual adventure, because every one of us, I'm sure, has seen some part of that that resonates with us pretty clearly. I mean, how many times we meet somebody we thought was cool only to find out they were really kind of a tool? I mean, I've seen how many big groups have we seen grow up and fail? And, oh, this is the next greatest thing since sliced bread. And then the next thing you know, oh, that guy took $1,000 some nonsense like that <clears throat> happens all the time and has since the entire time I've been fooling around with this stuff and in the fish capacity. Hey, Brian. Hey, yeah. This is Bjorn. Do you mind if I pop in real quick and ask you a question? Right Throw it out there. Before, you, before you skip too far ahead from the topic the question is about, you mentioned Odin sacrificing himself to himself. Yes. In your opinion, what mm -hmm. do you think modern day what we can do for ourselves in, in, along the same vein <laughs> an ayahuasca trip killing the ego in the amazon that might work it's about the same that's kind of what i'm thinking <laughs> it's on the list anything else right. I, was, I was thinking something you know baby steps like cold showers or 
Give me a Wim Hof method. Yeah, that'll work yeah. too. <laughs> Fasting or something. I don't know. Um, Ayahuasca is on the list, though. It Absolutely. is for me too. I, I would like to see that. I would like to try that, and and and, and I'm hesitant to, to suggest those kinds of those things in the capacity that I'm in. Although I do it's a think there's personal a choice for sure. I, I think there's a benefit to it. I mean, I, there was a, there's a lots of documented knowledge of it, but I think things that grow out of the ground are worth investigating, oh, especially so if the government that we quarrel with often. <laughs> disapproves of certain methods and that makes me go "Ooh, then there might yeah. actually be something to it As a matter of fact there's a new documentary on netflix called changing your thinking or something like that uh, it's about all that stuff and bill wilson the spiritual experience that bill wilson talks about at the founding of alcoholics anonymous was a result of the psychologist he was working with giving him a dosage of lsd so there there is um, there's a real benefit to it you know, they've tried to recreate that for a, not such low bottom drunks. They try to go with higher, you know, people that still haven't lost everything and try to help them create that spiritual experience naturally. But you, you, it's very difficult to stop and think that this thing that's telling you how great you are may not necessarily be telling you the truth. Um, especially when we're tired or we're kind of wore out or we're in emotional pain or there's some kind of difficulty or blockage. Um, and sometimes I know when I'm tired, I will uh, I'll kind of feed on that energy. I'll feed on that anger. And I, and I might get angry about something that really has nothing to do. I'm going to be standing in the shower, washing my ass. Why am I mad about something that ain't even happened yet? Because I'm tired and I'm using fuel. Okay, I need to recognize that. I need to pay attention to that. Why am I thinking? Those are the kind of things that that look at it, and there's a there's a there's a lot of good work on it, and 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 all of it, all of it good. Some of you have to separate the wheat from the chaff because it tends to go a little too far. But <clears throat> we were so much more than just the thoughts we think. You know, we just we really are. There's there's established scientific research in Israel and Stockholm and Denmark that certain aspects of our brain are continuously working that are not uh, memories or thoughts. There are receptors of information from somewhere else that do not, that are not part of our five senses. So uh, if, what is if, that? if one is not, does not have access to ayahuasca, what yeah. are other realistic methods that everybody can do even in a small way? For um, that purpose? I'm a real advocate of professional help. I'm a real advocate of, 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 of finding a lay person or a therapist or something to work with and work through the issues that, that seem to pop up the most. Um, you, if you, um, there are, you know, there are, there are substances around that people use mushrooms being one of them, LSD, Masculine, some of the other stuff like that, that do have that effect of resetting the brain. I know for soldiers that have PTSD, there is an enormous amount of research being done right now to help them navigate that pain using psilocybin. And it is working. <laughs> it's very hard. To, the problem is we go through life and we build ourselves out of all of these little things that happen. And we build little people. So we we build this little piecemeal piece of who we are. And at, and at 51, I, I believe I know who I am because of all of these things and how I react to them and how I deal with them, and how I process them. And it's a very difficult thing to begin to think, dude, okay, congratulations. You got 51 years. You've been doing that wrong for a minute now. That's, that's hard to, it's hard to uh, comprehend. It's hard to, it's hard to look at that and say, damn, because when we really look at those kinds of things and say, well, I've been doing this wrong. Um, shit, man, I've caused a lot of people a lot of pain. I didn't want to do that. Uh, so I, I, writing it down is another way to do it. Write it down. You find a, a, a thought process that keeps returning to your head. When you're laying there at night and you're going through your thoughts and your thoughts are kind of working before you go to sleep and thoughts keep coming up, Try to pay, step away from them. 
You try to pay attention to the thoughts that keep returning. Why is that thought there? What does that make me feel like and why? Write the stuff down, begin to journal. Journal is Journaling is a nice first step into such a foray of, of, of trying to dissolve the ego or trying to get it into a healthy perspective so you might observe it. You know, and um, there's, a, there's a video on, uh, there was a movie called Revolve and it had Jason, Jason Statham in it. At the end of it, there are several uh, very powerful scientific figures <clears throat> that talk about like a dozen of them that go over these ideas of the uh, of the ego. It, just look up for the look up revolver end scene credits, and it's it's an amazing little video that'll really give you a lot of food for thought, and it might put you on the right path to doing that. But journaling, I suggest, would be the best thing. <clears throat> um, Mushrooms are probably going to be the next thing that are legalized in the nation behind marijuana. Um, and there will be there will be places. And I do know that there are some retreats that you can do. And I know that there are several psychiatrists that are promoting these methods uh, while not necessarily administering them yet. But it's coming just because it does such a powerful reset on the individual. Because at some point, at some point in the middle of all of this, um, we get tired of fighting all the time. Sometimes it's nice to sit there and relax. It's <sighs> okay. It's very hard to do when we're wrapped up with how important we are and how right we think we are. And it really, and none of it really matters. We get wound up about whatever social issue, and we're not an elected official. We can vote. We can write our congressman, we can stand in the street, we can march, we can yell, we can holler, we can be banned from social media. But at the end of the day, what we do inside our homes is what counts the most. The structures, the faith, the spirituality, and the strength of our character that we impart upon our children is the most important thing we do. That's how we build a future. That's how we secure a future for all of us. I see you got your hand raised, Melissa. What is all that about? I'm going to ask you a question. Will you oh. um, clarify just because, you know, like everybody's take on it might be a little bit different, but I know that you have a very specific way that you talk about um, when Odin hangs on that tree and what it is he's actually trying to achieve. So would you mind clarifying that? Okay. So everybody knows Odin goes wandering. Um, and like us, he goes wandering after the Aesir Vanir War. Now, after three all powerful female Jotuns enter a golden age of Asgard, you have Odin there, right? Um, the three all powerful female Jotuns are Goldveg, which means love of gold or gold lover. Um, one is Frost Thief or Horse Thief. And one is Hythe, which is the bewitching one, the bewitching of men's minds. So, with those three, ideas that enter a civilization, the love of gold, the bewitching of men's minds, and the horse thief, or the ruination of the ability to work together as a team. Old Veg was burned three times. This is not Freya. I don't know where that nonsense came from, but it is not Freya. The Aesir Vanir War kicked off with one question. The Vanir said, should worship belong to one, or should it belong to all? We are gods as well. Odin, being at the top dog in a golden age of Asgard, the king said, y'all can go fuck yourselves, right? Well, he got his ass whipped, right? The, Van the Vanir won that war. He lost his throne. How many men do you know that have entered life making a shit ton of money, doing good, got the big ass truck, fucking dooley, got a damn good looking old lady just I mean, killing it. And the next thing you know is that old lady's cheating on him. He's bankrupt. He's living in his truck. He's homeless. Same parallel. He's got to figure some things out. He's got to start all over. Odin's case is very interesting because he provides an example for men to rebuild from such loss and devastating failure brought on by their magnificent egos. 
I'm the king of all that I see, and you can go whatever, right? Everybody's seen it. I've been it, and it sucks. Odin's particular example is he hangs himself on a tree, pierced to his side by a spear. That is not an accident. Krishna is the same thing, pierced to the side by a spear. Both tales culminated in a civilization that wasn't even a wet dream in the world when both Krishna and Odin's story were told as, as the Jesus for the crucifixion of Jesus of Nazareth. Right? Pierced to the side by a spear, crucified, blah, blah, blah. <coughs> in Odin's case, nine days and nights, he hung there. There's nobody to help you. Think about sitting in jail. Nobody there to help you. You're on your own, buddy. There are a few things more devastatingly painful than realizing, fuck, I have screwed the pooch so badly, I am out here by myself. Odin is in that very thing. And what does he do? He figures out how to sacrifice himself to himself. He figures out how to get out of his own way. How do I stop this? How do I become better? I get out of my own way. Okay. So he sacrifices himself to himself at the edge of death. Now, the story says he fell shrieking. I don't believe he fell. I think he was cut down. You're not going to get to hear the songs of your ancestors, for those who have passed through the veil, unless there is a very powerful goddess that lets you do so. Now, the thing about hell is she is the guardian of all of the cumulative knowledge of all the people that have passed on, all the beings that have passed on, all the nine realms. So think about all the knowledge she has access to. So when Odin hears the songs of his ancestors and he picks up the runes, he has literally picked up the cumulative knowledge of everyone that's gone before him in the shape of the runes. <clears throat> what do we learn? When we get rid of our ego. It's kind of like uh, Sigurd and Brunhild. You know, the, the, when he, he, he slays the dragon and gains the treasure and figures out how to become a man and understands how to cross the fire around the ring of a woman's heart. And in return, uh, she, he gives, she gives him a memory draw and also teaches him the runes. Some very interesting parallels of slaying the dragon. Everyone wants to look out there for something to slay. I assure you the most nefarious dragons or challenges that you'll have to face right here are, are these things in here. These are the things that we have to learn to conquer. Uh, the great dragons that we have to, to slay aren't out there, they're in here. And Odin and Sigurd and even Baldr are a prime example of that. In the first chapter of the book, I go through all the rest, Buddha, Krishna, um, <laughs> So, all of them. all of the all of the Central Asian sun deities go through the same thing, and you would want to think that it was localized to that area. Hercules is one, but it's not. You can go to Japan, you can go to China, you can go to Central America, South America, North America. All of them have the same story. That parallel is told in every one of them. So, this deity dies. He faces something, he is reborn, he ascends. He dies, he is reborn, he, he, he dies, he faces something, he reborns, he ascends. That is a symbolic treatment of a very real issue that we all have to deal with. We all come across a challenge that feels like our world is falling apart. Our world is falling apart. I've lost everything. What's going to happen? You know what's going to happen? You're going to keep living. This is the one opportunity, this is the reset that we get to figure out how to do it right. Or we will repeat the cycle. And we will lose everything again. And we'll start all over and try one more time. And then we'll lose everything again. <laughs> Just the way it goes. There are some things to figure out. And it's told in all of the ancient spiritualities again and again and again. It's a real challenge to try to figure that out and answer that question. Uh, so when I say Odin's sacrifice of himself to himself, is Odin setting the example of how to get rid of our ego? It is not an easy process. It sucks. It hurts. 
to come face to face. <laughs> in Arthurian legends, uh, and in some Celtic legends, there, you know, a king will come across some young woman in his youth, and he will build a powerful, wonderful empire, and he will be gifted this powerful phallic symbol of the sword to, to set up and become king, and he becomes king, and then he loses that love. Every man has a story of some woman that he truly loved that just broke his heart. Every woman has the same thing of, of challenges to endure. Will I be woman enough? Will I be woman enough to, to carry a child? Will I be woman enough to keep his attention? All of these challenges we face. I know for men at a middle age, you know, he is faced with that again. She shows up in his life as the crone. It takes various forms. And for King Arthur, when he was wounded, king and the land was suffering. The land and the king were one. The land was suffering as much as the king was. And he had to go challenge and fight that young aspect of himself to heal the land and heal the king. You have to do the same thing. You have to face those, that, that wounded child inside us. And it's a very old tale, and it's told again and again. It's always a feminine in those tales that provides the light to guide the man to become who he's supposed to become, to build himself into what he's supposed to build. She provides the direction. The Lady of the Lake. <clears throat> uh, Kali, coupling with uh, Shiva, or Krishna, I get him confused. Kali is on a tear, just, you know, just going, just slaughtering shit. I, mean, I don't know if y'all seen a woman that mad, but I have, and it's not fun. Shiva comes down, lays himself in front of her, and their imagery of her coupling with him, wild, primal, feminine savagery, tongue hanging out, writing him, just very, almost pornographic. But from that point, that's the point where he understands who he is supposed to be. She helps build, she provides that light and that guidance for him to understand who he's supposed to become. So there's a lot of interesting things. That's why that, that tale is one of the reasons I believe that hell was very much involved in that Odin sacrificing himself to himself. And I one time started writing a book of uh, him hanging there and at first a little girl talking to him until she became full grown and cut him down as he figured out who he was and who he was supposed to be. But I suck at that kind of that writing dialogue. <laughs> it's just a rough draft somewhere. How was that? I got to rambling, but that's what I feel about it. Thank you. <laughs> I have a question if nobody else does. Go ahead. Now, I might be speaking from ignorance because I don't know the full details of the situation, but I, what do you think about this? Yeah. Do you think the reason a lot of these different religions have similar stories is, become, is because they come from common roots, plus most of them were focused on especially solar cycles and the, you know, the winter solstice when the sun went down for three days and then rose again? It would stand again, again. in some places. Yeah, some places it stands still on the horizon for three days. I mean, there's an imagery of Hercules where he is, he is swallowed by a whale at Joppa, same place Jonah is. Um, in fact, all of the tales in the Old Testament are forgeries or copies of much older pagan tales, every single one of them. And much of the New Testament is as well. Um, Hercules is swallowed by a large fish or whale at Joppa, same place Jonah was. And when he comes back after three days, he's shorn of his beard. And the beard is a representation of the shining of the sun. So that, that, that was the, the three-day winter solstice. Um, <clears throat> it takes many forms, but I think, I, I think that um, the condition of human existence and the, and the dynamics of the sun, the moon, and the stars providing guidance um, provided men with enough substance of faith to build megalithic temples and pyramids and shit that we can't copy today. Now, as far as the common origin, I, 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 you know, unless you want to talk of Kavasir, perhaps, and there are other tales of seven sages. The first imagery of Quetzalcoatl, the earliest imagery of Quetzalcoatl is a white man with a flowing beard, like Kavasir. Um, perhaps, who knows, there's a lot, there's a lot to it. And you, the further back you go, uh, the more you understand there was international trade in the Bronze Age. Copper from the Great Lakes, the tin from Cornwall provided the bronze for much of Northern Europe to be, be part of the Bronze Age. Whereas down south, they got it from uh, Turkey and Afghanistan. 
right? So yeah, there's some of it would be from trade, some of it would be from language, but I think the greater preponderance would be simply the human condition. Um, there are several, there are all races, right? And all of them in their own regions have a spirituality laid out that's most palatable and understanding to the environment in which they live, right? So it would be very difficult for me to explain to Scotty to say uh, someone that has a, a that understand Nancy of the of the, the spider god of, of the West Africa. How would they even understand the two? How would Genghis Khan comprehend, say, Pele of Hawaii? Uh, perhaps the knowledge and learning he probably could. And I know there's volcanoes in Kamchatka and throughout China and Japan, <clears throat> or a sea god, a fish god. So it doesn't matter really what it takes. It doesn't really matter what it looks like. I think it tends to fall down towards our human experience is very much the same. It's very much the same. Um, we have created the new emotions. And I think as we begin to look at the animal kingdom and begin to comprehend the sentience of dolphins and whales and elephants and other things that will eat your ass, <laughs> like bears, think that we need to begin to become comprehend that a little bit better. Um, there's some, there's other, you know, when I first came in, I always thought it was a joke. There was a group called the Odin Brotherhood. Some of you, some of you older folks might remember it. And it was largely a, a, a it was a Yahoo group. I don't think that we, we didn't really ever see each other. I mean, we made comments. And one of their big deals was when the world is pregnant with lies, a secret long hidden would be revealed. And I was like, that's just, what? But the more I listen to it, the more I'm like, wow, what if that's true? Because you look at things and you know, all the things we need to understand. I don't know. I, that's just my opinion on it. Of course, that, that doesn't make it right, doesn't make it wrong. It just, it just helps me navigate the world that I live in. You know what I mean? Anybody have any other questions? I was just going to add on to a little bit of what you were saying and what Bjorn was asking. I think on top of the fact that all of these God or all these cultures have very similar stories, that just tells me that there's truth to the stories. So that's yes. easy. That's easy. Um, that a lot of these things happened. <laughs> if 10 different cultures spread across the world, talk about a great flood, and guess what? There was probably a freaking great flood. <laughs> You're right. And, except, and, and it goes on and on. But on top of that, I think the reason that another reason why so many of the cultures and religions are so similar is because, as you mentioned, they're all based on human nature and the human experience. And no matter where we live or what struggles we're going through, the earth is unforgiving. Human is uh, life is unforgiving. Life is hard. Uh, life finds a, <laughs> life finds a way, but life is hard. And there's a reason that so many of these cultures focus on the sun because not only does the sun give so much of what we need to survive as a human race, but also at the same time, the sun experiences a cycle the sun the moon the earth it's all cyclical it's the same thing with um the golden age and the death at ragnarok and the rebirth that with balder um it's all cyclical and it goes down from you know natural forces at large all the way down to in modern science we learn of the death and, re and re revigoration of cells and at an atomic level all the way up from the biggest to the smallest cycles and circles within cycles within circles and it's it's found firm, forms the foundation of life so basically so basically as above so below which makes me think of the realms coexisting among each other in the same locations existing in different ways Maybe. No? 
I think I think there's a lot of credence that I think that's one of those things that as we begin to understand sentience and other ideas and other people and other places and other living beings on this planet, even the trees that that exist here, we're going to be we're going to see that more and more and more. Those, those circles and cycles and the cycles, this as above, so below. I mean, that's that's something that's so crucial. To me, it just makes sense that things overlap. They do. Yeah, they all. It's funny. It's called a web of weird. <clears throat> but I think Nick, to speak to something what you said, that, you know, you were talking about the sun and the moon and the stars. I mean, they, and that's one of the things. That, that's the, one of the first things that gods did in the story of creation. Is they is they set the sun and the moon and the stars in place so I and mean, took time. And they did it in a way that that, that resonated with uh, nine, and which is a derivative of seventy two, which is number of heart number of beats our heart makes. You know what I mean? So on and so forth. It's in, it, you can get lost in it. You know what I mean? You can get lost in those kinds of things. Well, but I the think God, the gods had to build life and they knew what they needed in order to do that. So they knew the processes they needed to put into place and see, there's, the, there's, the there's, vibrations there's, they needed to set it at. And see there, there, you know, I, as I, as I write in that, in the new book, I'm, there's a couple of places in there where I look at it and I'm like, there are so many of us operating with a faith stronger than anything any follower of Abrahamic religions has ever had to muster. You know, we, we, we face failure and disappointment and, and confusion uh, about the things that we follow, the things that we want, the things that we know somehow inside of us are true. That, and then all of a sudden, we don't have anything to support it, and we continue to move forward. If that's not the kind of faith that changes the world, I don't know what is. Do you, you know what I mean? But we don't have to have, because we don't have this faith in this omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent being. Our gods have are more are oh so more real, because they have faults and struggles and trials and tribulations that they ha they too have to go through i mean you mentioned the all the women, the lady drama that odin goes through right and uh, and it goes on and on i mean scotty does not marry who she wants to marry right. she fights and bickers with Njord because he wants to live at the sea and she <laughs> hates the seagulls and she wants to live in the mountains and he hates the cold their lives aren't perfect, idealistic things. They're a representation and a mirror of the lives that we live and the struggles that we have because they experience these struggles because those are the struggles of life. They can, they, even, even the gods cannot avoid that, but they have all of these powers and grandeur all the same beginning of the of the Gilbagony, it, it's, it asks king after he loses half his shit to a woman to a goddess she, he, he goes to find the Aesir and he has the question of um, do all things go their way because of the nature of their being and you have to wonder about the, about that statement at the beginning of the, the tale he, is it by magic or does, do all things go their way because of the nature of their being? What an interesting comment. What the kind of comment that could, you know, if we can emulate these actions that they that they try to pursue, then things go our way as well. Um, prayers and sacrifices and offerings, humility and gratitude, um, and knowing how to question and answer well. I submit to you that it would probably take that it would probably have taken me much further long ago than, than you know what I mean? But we've got to learn it, you know, we've got to figure it out. And I think in a world that's as, as it is today, people need that kind of simple compassion that I, that I think they demonstrate. And I think you find it in, in all, I mean, the Hindus are very successful. I think the Hellenistics, the Hellenes, uh, I, know, I know some of them. They're finding the same kind of 
find, finding the same kind of strength there. I have looked for chematism, chem people to follow that. I'm not having much luck with legitimate followers of chematism. I see a much overrun look at the political activism that, that it kind of gives it a, a, a bad flavor. But all of these pagan faiths, Brodnovery, the Brodnovery, it's still very much a practice of these two Slavs. <laughs> it's there. Well, everything we need is there. All the, all the guidance and support, um, it's there. It's just a matter of us. I still can't get over that guy in his TikTok video. And he was fired up about it, man, talking about how Nazis can't have this sample. All I can think of was, who the fuck do you think you are telling anybody what they can have? <laughs> you know what I mean? What business is it of anybody's? <laughs> you know, do what you can do. Man. Figure it out. Grow, live, love, be happy. Yeah. But some of those I see, I saw one recently that um, if anybody hurts you or if anybody offends you, it's something to do with your own unfulfilled pain or unfulfilled, unfixed pain. That's oh, true. That is desires. Very true. Because yeah, that's, that's very much true. Yeah, the reason my unfixed desire with that is they're interfering with my ability to succeed. Because yeah. <laughs> they, they called me a racist a long time ago and it still sticks. Ryan but look, is kick, kicked off Facebook for being a racist, misogynist, homophobic nigga. Well, I get kicked off because I don't even know why because they won't tell me. <laughs> but that's okay. <laughs> Facebook doesn't deserve any of you. <laughs> <laughs> right? But talking with Melissa, I mean, we're just talking about in uh, a group we have reading on leadership and self-improvement. And we're reading a book by Brian Tracy. And I just keep reading it over and over again in everything. And this is a completely secular book, no religious influence at all. But right. every single thing he mentions, I'm just like, we have that straight in our lore. It is every quote he brings, every concept he brings up. I'm just like, well, it says this right here in the Havamal. It says this right here in, it, it's just embodiment of, a, of the nine noble virtues. I'm just like, we have the framework for a successful life. Our ancestors may not have had all of this uber political left wing, right wing drama, uh, world immigration, diversification, PC bull crap, but they had they had to deal with, you know, nature and basic survival in a way that we don't. But mm -hmm. we have. It's it's a totally different struggles but we have all we have just as many as they did and our gener our ancestors well every single one of us have ancestors that survived and thrived or we wouldn't be here they were able to reproduce and survive and carry on so every one of every single one of us have ancestors who figured something out it's within all of us to do it and continue on and fight our own struggles and survive our own problems within the day. And we have, if how to become a millionaire leadership books are telling us the exact same things that our lore is telling us, then there's, there's some truth to that. I don't think you're wrong. I, I think um, I sometimes look at the fact that we don't have to struggle like our ancestors did, that we do live in a very comfortable a very comfortable world where we can go to the store right down the street and have access to as much food and feast like a king would in the Middle Ages. So that leads me to my next thought would be why? Why are we set up in such a comfortable fashion and we, we squander? I think that uh, the some few of us that have begun to step away from the traditional roles of an outside societal norms of spirituality as they've been defined, I think this comfort, while many detest it, has given us the freedom to explore the kind of horizons necessary to help build better times um, as, as this one begins to fall apart at the seams. Uh, so it's, it's an interesting, huge challenge. And obviously we don't want to get bogged down with dogma, but we do want to find that which works best for us. And the one thing that works best in the medium it was designed for is money. 
our ability to be successful in the world um, really is, is a litmus test. And while we may not, we may detest many aspects of it. If you look at what the Mormons have done in 150 years, I would submit to you that right now we are watching the building of the next Rome uh, right there in Salt Lake City, Utah with what they're building. Doesn't matter if it's true or real or anything else. They are all bought into it, lock, stock, and barrel, and they support it with their finances. And it's growing, and it will continue to grow. And it will continue to be a very wealthy player. One of them just ran for president. And up until the 70s, it was legal to kill one in Missouri. So we are changing. And, I, and there's something in me that, that believes that this also has that possibility. But I think we, we, we've got to navigate some of these landmines that others would place in our, in our path. Uh, the Lord is too heavy to Christianize. Okay, well, now what am I supposed to use? I'm supposed to listen to your words? I'm supposed to listen to my words? Mm, that's probably not going to work. Um, so let's take another look at that too heavy to Christianize aspect. And now, now, if you haven't seen that video, I highly suggest you take a look at it because it's, uh, it's got some important information in it. <laughs> we have, you know, the fact, the fact of the matter is, is that we, we have an opportunity if we can step outside of being, when we, when we have this wound of faith, when we have this wound of a loss of faith or the changing of faith or, or the dramatic experiences that come with such radical supposition that I'm going to change the foundation of my spiritual being, um, without proper guidance or, or, um, or somebody to hold your hand or prop you up or tell you that they care or provide some kind of appropriate guidance that doesn't suggest uh, you need to hate them because they hate or you're really a victim and you just don't know it. Um, it, it leaves people in, a, in, a, in an area where they're easily manipulated. And we're never aware of that until we've had to go through it. That may be one of the tests that we have to go through perhaps, but <clears throat> if we can begin to successfully navigate that, if we can begin to let some of the echoes of, of, of picking the low-hanging fruit that have always been kind of successful, I think we might. I mean, I live in a town of 16,000 people. I work in a plant that has 195 people in it for a, a Fortune 100 company. There are, there are six of us that are pagan out there. And every day I walk through this town and see somebody that's got a hammer or got a tattoo or something along the lines or kind of on the back of their hands. Hey, how you doing? Uh, they're all kind of out here doing it on their own. Um, what would it look like if, if uh, I built a building and started hosting gatherings? You know, there's so they're, all around us, it's there. It feels like the raw material is there to build something magnificent. Um, how? Why? Um, those are the things that, that we have to, to ruminate on and negotiate. Um, what would change the world? What will that radical idea look like? It's, there's a lot going on, I think. But I think um, we've got to begin to apply our true thought process of who we are to all that, all of the things that we went through, all of the things that we've experienced, all of the, all of these things that have let us down and left a bad taste in our mouth or made us struggle or made us wonder. Dreams and friendships and hopes and desires and love and all of these things that, that provide the positive guidance and direction that we need, where best do we focus that? For myself right now, I find that I'm, I'm returning to very much the roots of my origin with, with focusing that in, in, um, in the group of friends that I've had for many years now, um, which I find to be a truly rewarding experience because it, uh, it hasn't failed. And I think that's something that, you, that we have to look at. I don't talk to many of the people I went to high school with, one or two of them, but there are people that I've known well over a decade now in this faith that I can call and say, hey, you know what? What's going on, man? You bet I got you. 
my gosh, if that's not a real treasure of this spirituality, I don't know what it would be. That ability to make a connection, go to an event and make a legitimate connection and hold somebody's hand and give somebody a hug and share a horn with me, that's where the real strength of all of this lies. I don't know where that came from. I think I just had a left for someone. I hope you enjoy it. <laughs> Anybody else have any questions? I don't got a question, but I just do want to thank you for getting on here and doing that this evening. I know it's been a while and it was it was really refreshing to be able to do that again. So I appreciate it. I think next week if we can all get together or or and we'll we'll sit down and we'll hammer out some details on the next chapter of this book and we'll put that in the credits. <laughs> credits to, awesome. the, to the to the various people of the noble minded Ethan to help craft a chapter on exploring the the stages of adventure on a new spiritual horizon. I think that's cool as fuck. Fuck that chicken soup for the soul. I think we got this whipped. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right. Tell the dirty joke Bye. and say goodbye or what? <laughs> What'd you say, Tish? I so said, thank you, Brian. I'm going to go because I got to get my homework done. I got to start my class, too. I start, I start today English literature. And I don't know how to do that. I know, right? Oh, All right, you guys. got it. Thank you, Brian. I appreciate it. I appreciate everybody coming in today. I really do. I'm going to stop recording. You guys all have a really good night.